first in the uh, auditorium, and then we'll go probably to phone lines next. So um, go ahead. Thanks. Hi, Ryan Blackshaw Vargas again from Spectrum News. Uh, you mentioned there's lots of questions that will be answered. What's the number one question you want answered after two years? Uh, I think the number one question we want to answer is what's the structure and the energetics of the interior of Mars. And so we have uh, several things that, that, we're, that we want to measure. We want to measure the thickness of the crust, the size of the core, the density of the core, and the seismic velocity of the mantle, which tells us sort of what the uh, structure of the mantle is. And those are kind of our key questions, as well as the amount of heat coming out of the planet. So um, when we proposed this mission eight years ago, we put together what we call our level one science requirements. And these are the, the things that sort of we promised NASA that if you choose our mission, these are the, the, the things that we're going to measure. And that's kind of our, our, our list of measurements. And then we also are going to measure how often, seismic, how often Mars quakes occur, and how often meteorites strike Mars, which is kind of a, a, a bonus. And then a follow-up question. How does all of this help us understand life here on Earth? Will we understand better earthquakes? Will we understand volcanoes better? Will we understand you know, what kind of everyday parts of our life here will the InSight mission help us understand? Well, what it really helps us understand is, is, is how we got to where we are today. Um, how we got to an Earth that has an atmosphere which is, which is breathable, uh, an environment which is in a temperature range which is comfortable for life, how we have a planet that's covered with water. Um, these are all things that, that are related to the activity and the structure of the inside of our planet. It's not really, it's not obvious to everybody, but you know, the, the fact that we have an atmosphere is because we've had all these gases that have come out of the inside of the planet. Uh, the, the reason we have uh, ocean is because the water has come out from, uh, from, from volcanic activity over, over the billions of years. And so uh, that activity is tied to the initial conditions of the planet. And so we'd like to understand how that happened, how we got to where we are today. Thank you. Yeah, and if I, could, if I could just add to that, um, you know, uh, life started on Earth, we think, uh, you know, very early, early on in the first half billion years. And, you know, that crust is uh, almost uh, gone on the, on the surface, from the surface of the Earth. Whereas on Mars, that very early crust is still preserved, those environments that it formed super early in the formation of, of planets, of our solar system. And so, you know, we can kind of go back in time and study those environments on the surface of Mars and, and understand how the conditions inside the planet created those environments. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take one more here in the auditorium and then I'm gonna to go to the phone lines and then we'll, we'll be coming back. Hi, Ian O'Neill for um, Scientific American and HowStuffWorks.com. Um, going back even further than that question, um, how does your assembly of uh, instruments and experiments help explain the origins of planets themselves? I mean, was, was it, uh, you're actually, it's almost like a time probe looking back over four billion years ago, but how, how do you hope this will add pieces to that puzzle? Well, as, as, as you said, the, uh, the structure of the planet is really formed in the first few tens of millions of years after the planets, planetar, planet accrete. So we don't have, we're not going to have much to, to, to say about how the planet actually accreted, but once it gets you know, formed from the, the solar nebula, how it changes from you know, sort of a, a uniform ball of, of meteoritic material, which is all kind of the same stuff, into a planet which is differentiated, which has a, a, a crust of, of, of uh, relatively uh, light rocks, you know, and a very dense core, and uh, a, a very complex system uh, of, of transferring the heat from the center of the planet to the surface. Uh, these things are all kind of set up very early in the planet's history. And uh, for the Earth, we don't really have any evidence of that system left anymore. What we have is a very evolved system uh, and so we want to go to Mars to see what that system looked like very early in, in, in the process. And so to better understand the, 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 uh, the physics and the chemistry of how you go from the, the very, very initial uh, set of conditions with this uh, sort of solar dust and ice that, that's, that's accreted into the very complex planets that we see today. And uh, just one follow-up. Um, in regards to meteorite impacts, how many, how many meteorite impacts do you expect to detect with your instrumentation? Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's the question. Um, well, one of the things that we want to actually 
find out is, is actually measure how many, how many we're, we're, we're sort of expecting something of the order of maybe a half a dozen to a couple of dozen in the, in the two years that, that we're on Mars. Cool, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, we're going to the phone lines next. Um, we've got about three different callers right now. We're gonna start with the AP. Go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, this is Marcia Dine, AP. Uh, I have a question I'd like both Philippe and Tillman to answer. Uh, NASA has a long and rich history of exploring Mars, and as the relative newcomers to this, I'd like to know from both of you what you find so captivating and magical about Mars versus other planets. I don't want to catch everything. Could you repeat to me? She, she wants to know what you find fascinating and, and captivating about us uh, going to Mars and studying Mars. Everything is captivating first. It's a dream first. On after there is a big challenge because that instrument was supposed to be so uh, so sensitive that at the beginning it was just impossible to build. Okay, but we did it with the help of our partners and particularly GPL. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. And would Tillman like to also weigh in? Okay, um, to me, you know, Mars is a a planet that is on the one hand, you know, very different from the Earth. On the other hand, it's quite similar. You know, it's half the size of uh, of the Earth, but its environment on on the surface is uh, you know more Earth-like than, for instance, the atmosphere and the environment of Venus. And understanding the difference between the Earth and Mars, you know, will help us understand the evolution of terrestrial planets in general, and in particular the Earth. And this is what you know makes the motivation uh, for for going to Mars. And in addition to that, it's easier to explore Mars, you know, than Venus, uh, and um, and therefore Mars is a is the first target, you know, to do a geophysical observatory like we, we now do on Mars. So it's timely, and it's very much, you know, justified to do that now. Okay, our next question on the phone line is from AFP. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is Ivan Kron of Agence France Press. Uh, you mentioned Mars quakes and meteorite, meteorite strikes. Can you talk in details about the other possible sources of vibrations that you might uh, listen to? Sure. Uh, so... so those are the, the two primary uh, sources of vibrations that, that, that we hope to see. Uh, we also actually will, will probably see uh, vibrations due to the uh, interaction of the atmosphere with the surface. So when you have uh, you know, weather on Mars, you have turbulence, that actually is pushing the surface up and down. Um, that will create, on one hand, it creates noise that makes it harder to see the Mars quakes. But on the other hand, um, when you start uh, beating on a planet like that, it'll actually start resonating at certain frequencies, and those resonances are uh, affected by the structure of the planet. And so we may actually be able to get some information from that. Uh, and, and finally, what we, we sh should also be able to measure is actually the, this is not exactly a vibration, but it's the motion of the surface up and down uh, due to the tidal pull of the uh, Martian moon Phobos. And so every time Phobos goes overhead, it actually pulls the surface up a little bit, and then it goes back down after, after Phobos leaves. And, and so um, we can actually measure that. It, it goes about, mm, about a centimeter and a half, uh, a little over half an inch uh, up and down uh, when, when Phobos goes over. And it turns out that we can actually use that uh, measurement as well to look at the inside of the planet, because how much that goes up and down depends on sort of the elasticity of the planet and whether the core is solid or liquid. And so we'll be able to use that measurement um, as, it, as it happens uh, uh, every seven hours or so on Mars to, to, to probe the inside of the planet. And if I may, could, you, could there be some magma movement at all from, from, from the inside? Um, there could be magma mo motion on Mars. Uh, the area that we're, we're landing in is pretty featureless. I mean, it's, it was a, a lava plain, but it was set, put down you know, several billion years ago. So we're not expecting any uh, active uh, volcanic activity in our region. Um, it's possible that it could be happening somewhere else on Mars. Uh, uh, it's conceivable that we could pick that up with our seismic uh, instruments, but uh, we're not expecting it. Yeah, but uh, you know we are in a good place. Uh, it was about a thousand kilometers uh, to an uh, area that may have been volcanically active in the last you know ten million years. So for Mars, that's you know yesterday. So uh, we can we can hope we can hope that we might uh, hear some magma deep under the ground, not at the surface, but deep underground. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, we're taking one more uh, from the phone line and then we'll come back into the room. We're going now to space.com. Go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. This is Megan Bartels from space.com. I had a question for Lori. I was hoping you could talk sort of big picture. Why, why is it that we're so fascinated with Mars and we keep returning with science missions? What is it that really captures us about the planet? It's a great question, and Mars is an incredible natural laboratory right next door to Earth. And as I was kind of alluding to at the beginning, we really want to understand how the we, how we came up with this diversity of rocky planets in our solar system. They're all very different. Each one of them um, is unique in its own way. And trying to understand how they ended up so differently is a really important question. And Mars is a great natural laboratory. It's right there. It's reasonably easy to get to. We demonstrated that we now we can land successfully on the surface. We can conduct scientific experiments for long durations on the surface. Um, so it's very amenable to, to trying to do these types of investigations. And then in addition to that, Mars has another piece of, of uh, uh, intrigue for us in that it could have potentially had a significant amount of water there in the past. We see lots of evidence of that in the geology. And so we do believe that there was a lot of water there and it could have potentially been a place where life could have formed very early in Mars's history. And of course, trying to understand how life is or was distributed across our solar system is one of the, the major questions that we have. Are we alone? Were we alone sometime in the past? And so Mars is really an intriguing destination for that purpose as well, trying to really understand what those conditions were like back four billion years ago. Did life actually begin on Mars uh, at, in that time frame? And if it did, is there any preservation of that left on the, on the surface? Of course, that's not the focus of the InSight mission, but it is the focus of a lot of the other investigations that we're interested in at Mars. And so trying to better understand Mars in that context is important. And then finally, um, as was alluded to this morning in the mission briefing by Dr. Zabukin, you know, we'd like to eventually get humans back to Mars. Uh, we're interested in uh, a campaign now in returning humans to the moon and eventually getting humans to Mars. Again, another destination in our solar system where we feel it is amenable to human exploration and a place where we could, um, could go at some point in the future. And science drives our understanding that allows us to get humans to a place like Mars. And so the more exploration we have, the better we understand that environment, the better prepared we'll be to send humans to Mars in the future. Thanks so much. Okay, we're going to bring it back into the room here for questions from media and then from social media. I see our team over here working furiously collecting your questions, so stand by for that. Go ahead with your question. Hey, uh, Charlie Shelton with CV Weekly. I have a question about the Olympus Mons formation. Uh, what is it that is different between Earth and Mars about uh, tectonic motion? Why do the plates not move and allow something so big to build up? Yeah, so um, I mean, that's part of what we hope to learn from this mission, in fact. Um, you know, for the first order answer is that Mars is a lot smaller than the Earth, and so it doesn't have the same amount of, um, uh, of radiogenic material, the same amount of heat that it starts out. So uh, just being a smaller planet, it loses its heat more rapidly. So uh, you, know, you need to have a, a vigorous convection, a lot of energy inside the planet to drive that motion of plate tectonics. Um, you know, people have proposed in the past that maybe, maybe very early in Mars's history it had plate tectonics. Now, we don't have any direct evidence of that, um, and, you know, we don't expect to see evidence of that uh, on Mars with our mission, but, uh, you know, it's always the things that we don't expect that turn out to be the most intriguing. So, you know, who knows what we'll, what we'll find in the interior. Follow up to that. Is there any way to tell either from aerial view or a mission like this, maybe in a different area, if there is a previously active subduction zone or any of those other things, or can you tell even where any of the transform faults are? Um, so, so uh, you know, people had proposed that there might have been subduction and transform, uh, there, are, there are, we do see evidence for transform faults from the, from the high resolution topography data that we have. 
Um, and in the past, people had proposed that there might be subduction zones on Mars. Um, we think that uh, th that's, that's not the leading hypothesis for how the northern plains formed. It was previously proposed as an option for um, how the, that low topography in the northern hemisphere formed. Uh, we now think it's uh, likely due to um, the presence of a huge impact early in Mars's history. And you know, we've, we've come to that hypothesis based on um, the topography, the gravity data, uh, the, the geology and the faults that we see at the surface. Um, you know, Insight will actually be adding to our knowledge of how these two hemispheres formed. We'll be understanding uh, you know, the thickness of the crust, which we don't know very well at all now. Um, we'll you know, see perhaps if there's a difference in the, in the composition and the thickness. We know there's a thickness difference between the north and the south, but um, getting the exact difference between those two will help us better interpret these, these hypotheses. And you know, we assume it's going to support the uh, impact theory, but again, we'll, we'll find out. Thank you. All right, we're taking a question right here. Go ahead. Hello. Steve Gorman from Reuters. Uh, so two questions. One, uh, uh, how long if after the, the InSight lands, if it, if it arrives safely and settles safely, will it begin to conduct, uh, you know, will the seismometer and the heat probe begin to do its thing, their things? And then, and then also a very specific question about the sensitivity of the seismometer. I, I believe you said in the past, Dr. Bernard, that, that that it would measure seismic waves as small as the diameter or half a diameter or half the radius of a hydrogen atom. Could you give me that one more time? Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, the, the, the sensitivity, of the sensitivity of the seismometer is uh, in, in, in acceleration units, our requirement is, is uh, 10 to the minus 9 uh, meters per second squared. Um, and if you turn that into displacement, that comes down to less than 10 to the minus 10, which if you, depending on, on exactly how you, you, you define it, it's about half the radius of a hydrogen atom. And that's- Radius. Yes, and, and, and we're actually a little bit better than that over part of the frequency band. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, we're about a factor of uh, five better than that at, during, in, in some parts of, of, of the frequency. So yes, we're, we're, we're pretty doggone sensitive. And, and so one of the, one of the, 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 the issues that that, that, that that gives us is that that makes us sensitive to everything else that's happening in our environment. You know, if, if there's a little bit of wind, if the temperature changes a little bit, even if a little, little pressure uh, front goes by, it's gonna change the, 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 uh, the seismometer around. And so that's why we have uh, a weather station on board, which we haven't talked about much today because it's, it's not a part of our, our core mission, but we have a very comp uh, competent weather station. It's gonna give us uh, temperature, wind, and barometric pressure uh, 24 and a half hours a day uh, every, every day, every, every day on, on Mars. And so in addition to, to doing all this uh, uh, science about the deep interior of Mars, we're actually going to be contributing a lot of, to uh, understanding the, environment, uh, the surface environment of Mars as well. And, and okay, so in, in terms of how long it's going to take to, to get, to get uh, the instruments going, this is, so InSight's kind of a, it's kind of a laid back, uh, slow motion mission compared to a lot of things uh, that we've done before. We have a, a two year mission to, to, uh, to do our science. And so to get that mission started, we have to get our instruments on the ground. It's gonna take us about probably two or three months at least to get our instruments down. And, and that's because we have to do a survey of the, the area in front of the spacecraft, uh, make sure that we don't put the instruments down on a rock or, or in a hole or something like that. And then we're very, very, very careful about how we put the instruments down. Uh, you saw the, the, the animation that, that had the robotic arm going and picking up the instruments and putting them down. Um, it actually goes a lot more slowly than that, and we have a, a whole set of activities that we go through to ensure that when we put those instruments on the ground, they're gonna be in, in a place where they can operate properly and, and get these kinds of measurements. So it's gonna take us you know, probably a month or two to get the seismometer down, and another month or so to get the uh, heat flow probe down and penetrating down into the surface. So, um, what, whereas we're going to get some uh, some photos and some preliminary data back before that, in order to really get operating, uh, we're probably looking at uh, early next spring when we're really going to start bringing back that kind of science from Mars. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn it over to the social media team to tell us some of the questions that have been sent in. Well, Bruce anticipated one of the hottest questions out there that everyone was asking us how long until we get the data. Um, and you mentioned the cameras. Does Vane on Twitter ask, does Insight take pictures? And if so, will we be able to see them? 
It does take pictures, and you will definitely be able to see them. We have two cameras on board. We have uh, one's called our instrument context camera, and that's going to take a picture just a few minutes after landing. And it's, it's uh, bolted to the bottom of our deck, and it has a, a fisheye view, so it's going to show about 120 degrees, 130 degrees of, uh, of view just right in front of the lander, uh, perhaps even up a little bit above the horizon down to very, very, very down, very close down to the, the, the spacecraft. And that shows the entire area that we're going to be trying to, to uh, map out to deploy our instruments on. Um, and uh, then we also have another camera. It's actually attached to the robotic arm. It's a higher resolution camera, and we use the arm itself to point that camera, and we're going to be able to put together mosaics of both the area in front of the spacecraft and the entire region around the spacecraft. And those uh, images are going to go out onto the internet um, uh, more or less right away as soon as we get them. So we'll have raw images out on the internet uh, for people to look at uh, as the mission progresses. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, Winter in our YouTube chat wants to know, how will the InSight seismometer be able to map the internal structure of Mars in 3D with just one sensor? How is that accomplished? And uh, Rabbi Cooper over on Twitter uh, follows up, don't we need two or three to determine the in inner composition? You would think, wouldn't you? <laughs> so so usually, if, usually if anybody knows anything about seismology, you know that you need at least three seismometers to do seismology. And, and that's true unless you get really clever about it. So, so we had to get clever. I mean, we actually uh, had lots of concepts of missions that had three landers, four landers. We even had a concept with 18 landers on Mars at one time. And um, none of those actually ever got funded because they were very expensive. And so we had to go back to the drawing board and figure out, well, how can you do seismology, real quantitative seismology with a single seismometer? And it turns out there are quite a few uh, techniques that are, that are available to us. I mean, uh, and, and, and people have used this on the Earth, but they, they get uh, uh, sort of uh, eclipsed by the, 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 the uh, sort of array seismology that, that, that we normally do. And, and one of the things we do on Mars is we use the fact that Mars is small uh, to our advantage. And, and what happens is that in addition to the P waves and the S waves that, that, we, that uh, you normally hear about in, in, uh, in seismologies, there's also something called a surface wave. And that's a, a separate kind of wave that travels along the surface of the planet. And so uh, in, order, in, a, in addition to the P and the S wave, we actually get the surface wave, which travels to the seismometer. And there's another one that goes the other way around the planet and comes in the long way. And so there's, there's two extra what we call arrivals. And then finally, well, the one that's gone all the way around the planet can go around again and hit our seismometer. And these things can keep going around. Um, and they get a little bit, little bit smaller and smaller each time, obviously. So we use that extra information to be able to figure out how far away the, the, the uh, Mars quake is. And we can actually use a, what's called polarization analysis to figure out which direction it's coming from. And so in that, instead of having to triangulate on it using multiple uh, seismometers, we're actually able to use sort of the uh, extra information that's contained sort of later on in the seismogram in order to get the distance and the direction. That's, that's, and it gets more complicated than that, but, it, <laughs> but that's sort of the, the, the basic uh, method. We've got a mountain of questions, Veronica. How much time do we have? I think we're good. Don't go one more, and then I'll do a final uh, look in the room here to see if there's other questions. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, two-parter, two-parter. Okay. Uh, Oscar wants to know, is there an opportunity for citizen science uh, to participate with this mission? Um, well, we will be putting the, the uh, seismic data out on, on the, uh, the Internet um, within a few months after acquisition. Um, if you're a citizen seismologist, you can certainly uh, work on it. Uh, we'll also be putting the images out, and, and, and uh, there's, there's a, a very uh, uh, vigorous community of, of uh, photo interpreters uh, out there that have been uh, doing uh, photo interpretation on Mars images uh, for, for many, many years, and our images will be uh, available for that as well. We also have something called uh, 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 seismometers in the schools. And we're actually going to be sending the seismic data out to schools that are, which are participating in our, our program at the same time, basically, that our scientists and our team are going to get it. And so um, the, the uh, uh, students at, at uh, various uh, middle schools and high schools are going to be getting our data in close to real time. And they'll be able to uh, try their own uh, interpretations on it and, and so forth. And we're hoping that they don't uh, beat us to the punch in any of the big uh, discoveries, <laughs> but um, we'll see what happens. 
And, and, and additionally, we have a, a Mars Weather Service, so you can you That's can true. get uh, information about the weather daily at our site. You can get uh, wind, uh, atmospheric temperature, surface temperature. So you'll also get a daily weather report from our site. Okay, let me ask one more time out here in the audience. Yes, we do have a question here. It will get you a microphone. Um, Scott Sullivan from the Weather Network. Um, I'm really interested in knowing about the weather on Mars. So uh, this, as far as I understand, is the very first continuous weather monitor that we've put on Mars. Previous missions have put, have had weather, but it's uh, very distinct measurements every day. This is going to be, as you said, 24 and a half hours of every day. Um, do you anticipate learning anything really new about Mars weather that we didn't know about before? Um, the short answer is yes. I don't know what it is. We'll have to discover it. But yes, I mean, every time we, every time we go to a planet and look at something differently with a, it, with a different set of instruments in a different way, we always discover something new. And, and this is, as, as you said, this is going to be a, a, a unique uh, data set of continuous measurements, uh, temperature, barometric pressure, wind, uh, speed and direction. Um, all day long, all night, over an entire Mars season. Uh, and that's, that's obviously going to, uh, I think, just have a, a, an enormous wealth of, of, uh, of scientific information for us. OK, we're going to take one more social media question. And a reminder that if you have sent in a question with hashtag AskNASA, we'll continue to answer those after we go off the air. Go ahead, Stephanie. All right, so this is for all of our scientists here today. Um, Anna M. on YouTube would like to know, what would be more exciting for you, a result that meets your expectations or something completely unexpected? <laughs> that's, that's an easy one. <laughs> unexpected is always a lot more fun, yeah. yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Meet, meeting, your, meeting your expectations is, you know, it gives you a nice warm feeling, and then you say, well, what's next? What, what, what am I going to do next? If you see something that, that's unexpected, that always opens up a whole new a whole new you know, doorway into something that, that you never thought of before. And that's, that's, that, I mean, that's, that's what a scientist lives for, really. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the coolest part. Yeah. <laughs> what we don't know now is what is the coolest part. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, that's what we do as explorers, right? That's why we're here. That's why we're doing what we do, is to find those unexpected treasures that are out there, the new discoveries that are going to drive the next mission and send us to the next, the next destination. Oh, yeah. The root motivation is exactly what they said. I have nothing to, <laughs> nothing to add. I, except when, perhaps one point to precise that uh, there is a technological uh, thing, there is uh, the challenge of the science discovery that we are going to, to make. And uh, also there was a very interesting thing during all the development and also the following, is to work together with different culture, different languages, different money. <laughs> and uh, it's definitely very interesting that people on Earth are able to work together before we wanted to, to talk with Martians, for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that concludes our briefing for today. Thank you all so much for spending time here. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us all the way from Germany. We look forward to having you out here uh, for landing. I'll be coming on Friday. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, uh, I want to remind you about all the different activities we've got, uh, we've got going on um, up through landing. So, uh, to watch uh, our schedule on Sunday, which will be our final mission news conference before landing, and then also that afternoon we have a NASA social program that will also be televised on NASA TV. So, um, we have the news briefing at 10. Monday, November 26th. We want you to join us. Uh, the landing itself takes place about noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern. Our commentary begins one hour prior to that. And there are multiple ways that you can watch. The easiest way is nasa.gov slash live. Bookmark that now so you have it for Monday. You're going to be online Monday anyways for Cyber Monday. You're going to be shopping. Just have that extra screen open. <laughs> Um, we also have uh, a very good toolkit with a lot of in-depth information about the mission, uh, a lot of fact sheets, 
and a very good list of multiple ways you can watch. That URL is go.nasa.gov slash insight toolkit. There's great tabs there. You want to click on watch online. You will get a full list of all the different platforms where you can watch our broadcast, uh, including our 360 degree camera from inside mission control. And you will also find on that site a tab that says uh, watch in person. That includes a long list of public viewing events across the country. You've got viewing events from here in Los Angeles at Caltech and the California Science Center all the way across the country to New York, in Times Square on the NASDAQ Tower, and all the way into Europe. So please do go to that site if you want to join into a real conversation about landing. Uh, do that, and we look forward to having you back here on Sunday for the news briefing and Monday for landing. And uh, as we go into this Thanksgiving holiday for the uh, in the United States, I just want to wish everyone a very safe and happy Thanksgiving. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you on Sunday. We're going to play back all the graphics you've seen in the news conference today. Stand by.
has reached its destination, the red planet Mars. Welcome to Mission Control at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on Yehi Hill. Less than an hour from now, InSight will begin the most harrowing six and a half minutes of the entire mission, EDL, Entry, Descent, and Landing. The team is as prepared as it can be, but who knows what Mars has in store today. The crew's mission support area is filled with engineers monitoring the situation, and for the first time during a Mars landing, you can be in the room too. We have a 360 degree camera in this control room, 
allowing you to experience the landing right along with the team. There you see it. And to look up the link, just go to the Insight Watch page you see there on the screen. And this mission has actually two control rooms. The second is at Lockheed Martin Space outside of Denver, Colorado. Engineers there are on Council 2. Plus, people all over the world are tuning in at museums and libraries and other locations, including this one at the Pasadena Convention Center, and that is where friends and family are watching right now. There yeah, will good. also be an opportunity to watch in New York City. There they are cheering. There will be also an opportunity to watch in New York City when landing coverage gets displayed on the NASDAQ tower you see there in Times Square. And of course, if you are watching, please snap a picture and share it with us using the hashtag Mars Landing. We'd love to see it. Now I'd like to introduce you to NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you for so having me. We are so excited to have you here. Great to be here. So this is your first Mars Landing. It is. In this job. Now, I've, right. I, I have witnessed these as a... I should say from the sidelines for many years. Um, this is going to be the eighth time that we have a successful landing on Mars. Nope. Everybody knock on wood. That's right. Um, but uh, this is the first time for me to participate as the administrator. So it's excited? very exciting. Nervous? Very much. Not nervous. Not excited. Nervous. Look at very the amazing good. people here. Yeah. There's no very way I could good. be nervous. All right. So we hope to have you back on set after landing yep. and maybe take a couple of social media questions. Absolutely. All right. If you would like to ask the administrator a question, use the hashtag AskNASA. And before you go, you did ask about the Lucky Peanuts. Yes. So this is your bottle to take in there. Happily munching on these. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Now let's give you some background. Inside, in short, is short for interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport. It's different from other Mars missions, which all studied the surface. Insight is the first mission to study the interior of the red planet. The basic idea of Insight is to map out the deep structure of Mars. We know a lot about the surface of Mars, we know a lot about its atmosphere, and even about its uh, ionosphere, but we don't know very much about what goes on a mile below the surface, much less 2,000 miles below the surface down to the center. And this will be the first mission that's going to Mars specifically to investigate the deep inside of Mars. We know that the Earth is habitable, we know that Mars is not. There might be something that we find out in terms of the structure of Mars versus the structure of Earth that maybe can help us understand uh, why that is. InSight carries a seismometer which measures the seismic waves that have traveled through Mars from Mars quakes and maps out the deep interior structure of Mars. We're going to also have a heat flow and physical properties probe which will penetrate into the Mars surface about 5 meters or 16 feet to take the temperature of Mars. And it has a, a radio science experiment which uses the radio on the spacecraft to measure small variations in the wobble of Mars's pole to understand more about the structure and composition of the core. InSight will be the first mission to pick instruments up off the deck of the lander and place them on the surface of Mars. I like to say that we're playing the claw game on Mars with no joystick. The seismometer needs to be installed in one place and basically not move in order to get the best seismic data. We also have a wind and thermal shield that will then be placed on top of that seismometer to protect it further from the environment. For the heat flow probe, HP cubed, it also needs to sit in one place, take a while to hammer itself down into the ground and acquire the thermal measurements over a long period of time. InSight is a mission to Mars, but it's much, much more than a Mars mission. In some sense, it's like a time machine. It's measuring the structure of Mars that was put in place four and a half billion years ago, so we can go back and understand the processes that formed Mars just shortly after it was accreted from the solar nebula. By studying Mars, we'll be able to learn more about Earth, Venus, Mercury, even the Moon, even exoplanets around other stars. Landing on Mars is always difficult. More than half the missions have failed. 
our experts in this field are systems engineers for entry, descent, and landing. They speak EDL. Let me introduce you to two in our control room, Christine Soleil, who will be making the mission callouts during landing, and Julie Wurtz Chen. She is our color commentator who will help explain mission operations. Christine, let's start with you. I understand that there was a final software update and adjustment. What does that mean? That's right. Yesterday, we sent the last EDL software parameter update to the spacecraft's computer. This update told the spacecraft exactly when it will hit the top of the atmosphere and also fine-tuned things like when to deploy the parachute. This EDL software is very important because InSight uses this software to perform entry, descent, and landing completely on its own. Mars is so far away from Earth that when a command is sent from Earth, it takes about eight minutes for it to reach the spacecraft. Entry, descent, and landing from start to finish is less than eight minutes long. So InSight has to do this all by itself. All right, its fate is sealed. Now I understand that, that the team is about to do a readiness poll. Julie, can you fill us in on that? Sure, so that's gonna be a poll between our EDL communications engineer and several of the different orbiters and antennas that we have here on Earth. So we have Marco listening in on us, and MRO, which is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, will be listening to our data and recording it for us. And then the radio science uh, engineers will be eavesdropping in on our signal from all the way back here on Earth. And Sandy, our EDL communications engineer, will be checking in with them, making sure that they're all ready to go, ready to support us in just a little, you know, under an hour to land on Mars. All right, so we're standing by for that, for that yep. readiness poll. And I understand that the peanuts are going to be passed in there pretty soon? I believe that's the, that's the idea, yeah. We'll be passing around the peanuts very soon after that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the JPL peanuts are a, a tradition that gives us a little bit of extra luck on our critical events. So if anybody out there wants to join in on peanuts and give us some extra good good luck peanut vibe, we'd love to have it. Well, there's a story behind that, that way back when in the early days of JPL, there were several missions and uh, there were six Ranger missions to the yeah. moon that failed. Yep. But then with Ranger 7, Ranger seven somebody, some, somebody passed around peanuts. Yeah, yeah. And it worked. And you don't mess with what works. So <laughs> Absolutely. it's not a superstition. It's a tradition. All and right. uh, we just give ourselves that little bit of extra luck. All right. So you have, if you have peanuts at home, Please have some. That's right. All right. That's right. Thanks, us. Julie. Thanks. NASA has had seven successful Mars landings, but the EDL team never, ever becomes overconfident. JPL Chief Engineer Rob Manning says things have to work just right during six and a half critical minutes. Although we've done it before, landing on Mars is hard, and this mission is no different. The process to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the surface, we call Entry, Descent, and Landing, or EDL. It takes thousands of steps to go from the top of the atmosphere to the surface, and each one of them has to work perfectly to be a successful mission. The process starts well above the top of the atmosphere of Mars. The crew stage faces the sun. It also has its radio antenna, which faces Earth. But now we don't need the crew stage. Its job is done. The next step, just seven minutes before arriving to the top of the Mars atmosphere, is to separate the crew stage. Before you hit the top of the atmosphere, though, the space capsule has to orient itself so that the heat shield is precisely facing the atmosphere. Now the fun begins. The vehicle is moving at nearly 13,000 miles an hour but it's hitting the top of the atmosphere at a very shallow angle, 12 degrees. Any steeper, the vehicle will hit the thicker part of the atmosphere and will melt and burn up. Any shallower, the vehicle will bounce off the atmosphere of Mars. At the very top of the atmosphere, it's about 70 miles above the surface of Mars, and the air is starting to get thicker and thicker and thicker. As it does that, the temperature on the heat shield gets well over 1,000 degrees centigrade, enough to melt steel. Over the next two minutes, the vehicle decelerates at a back-breaking 12 Earth Gs from 13,000 miles an hour to about 1,000 miles an hour. At about 10 miles above the surface of Mars, a supersonic parachute is launched out of the back of the vehicle. 15 seconds after the parachute inflates, 
it's time to get rid of the heat shield. Six pyrotechnic devices fire simultaneously, allowing the heat shield to fall and tumble away from the vehicle, exposing the lander to the surface of Mars. 10 seconds after the heat shield is dropped, three pyrotechnically deployed legs are released and locked for landing. About a minute later, the landing radar is turned on, sending pulses toward the surface of Mars as the vehicle starts to try to measure how high it is above the surface and how fast it's going. At about a mile above the surface of Mars, the lander falls away from the back shell and lights its engines. And very quickly, the vehicle must rotate out of the way so that the parachute and the back shell doesn't come down to hit it. The last thing that has to happen is that on the moment of contact, the engines have to shut down immediately. If they don't, the vehicle will tip over. So if all the steps of entry, descent, and landing happen perfectly and we are safely on the surface of Mars, we'll be ready to do some exciting new science. Person later on in the program. Meantime, let me introduce you to someone who has been working on InSight for seven years. He's the project manager, Tom Hoffman. Seven years and Today's the day. That's right. Seven years, but we're just a little over, you know, 40 minutes now, and we're going to be on the surface. It's going to be awesome. Really exciting it's all stuff. All worth it. All right. So let's talk about Insight. It's using tried and true technology. It's based on Phoenix. This time, there's a bigger challenge with communication, correct? Normally, we have an orbiter that can give us bent pipe communications, but it's different this time. That's right. And most of the time when we've landed recently, we've had Mars Odyssey, which can do bent pipe communications. And so we get real-time data as we go through EDL. And we've come to expect that and actually we really, really want that. Um, in this case, our primary technology, primary orbiter is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so what that's going to be doing is actually will be listening to us on the UHF. If you go to the video, you can see this. Uh, MRO will be listening to us and be getting all the primary data and it will send it back to us, unfortunately, only at three hours after we land. So it doesn't give us the bent pipe live information. It, it doesn't. As it we happens. have a couple of other sources that we're looking at. We have a Green uh, Bank Observatory in West Virginia, Max Planck Observatory in Effelsburg, Germany, which will be giving us UHF. But those only give us a couple of different points in time. And so we did something kind of cool this time. Uh, we brought along a couple of CubeSats called Marco. And so hopefully, they, they're both working great today. Oh, fantastic. So we're hoping that they're going to continue to work all the way through EDL, and they will be giving us uh, real-time feed. So we can show how that works on the next uh, video there here. They are. So you can see here's InSight with its crude stage, getting close to Mars. But we have two stalkers. Marco can. If it works for us all the way down to the surface, we're going to have some great information coming from Marcos. So Marco is basically trying to fill that gap that we would have had if we had live communication coming down to us. Absolutely. So if it does not work, does it affect InSight's mission at all? No, not at all. We'll, do, we'll just be doing a little more nail biting, uh, but right now it looks like it's going, to, it's going to be working, but it doesn't impact InSight at all. And we have one final way that we're going to know that we've got successfully to the ground, which is the spacecraft will phone home. Okay. Once it gets down to the ground, it's going to have gone seven months through cruise, seven and a half minutes of tear, and it's going to call back and say, hey, I'm on the surface, I'm feeling pretty good, uh, everything looks good so far. And also to prep the audience, they're not, even after landing, we're not out of the woods just yet, correct? Not just yet. We have one more step that we have to do. We have to let the dust settle, quite literally. We're going to kick up a lot of dust when we land. We need to let that dust settle before we want to unfurl our solar rays. We're 100% solar powered, so it's very important that we get those out. Unfortunately, both MRO and Marco will be out of view by the time that we have those completely unfurled. And so we're going to have to wait five and a half hours until Odyssey comes by and tells us that, yes, indeed, our solar arrays are out. So we'll definitely have a celebration when we get successful landing, but we're going to have to temper that just a little bit and wait about five and a half hours to know absolutely for sure we're in good shape. So we have immediate knowledge if we have the Marcos. So just to run it through it once again, what's going to happen? We have the video of the show. 
how exactly is this all going to play out in six and a half minutes? And we can roll the video. Okay. Yeah, so you can see here we're attached to the cruise stage. We drop that off, say thank you for the ride to Mars. Uh, it burns up in the atmosphere. Uh, you can see it gets very hot on our heat shield. We're getting up in some places maybe 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit as we go through this. Uh, we're on the heat shield for about four minutes. That dissipates about 90% of the energy that we need to dissipate before we get to the surface. Uh, then we pop our parachute. We're going about 850 miles an hour for about two minutes. Then we'll drop off the heat shield. Uh, we'll start acquiring the ground with our radar, very much like an F-16 fighter jet radar. Uh, the legs will pop out. We'll start descending. We drop for just a second, which is very terrifying for me. Our descent thrusters, we have 12 of them. They're 68-pound thrusters. Start thrusting and dropping us to the ground. And slowly, slowly, we drop down, going only five miles an hour. So in that six and a half minutes of tear, which is a little less than the seven minutes, so that's great for me, <laughs> uh, we go from 12,300 miles an hour at 75 miles above the surface of Mars. We get to the surface, we're at five and a half miles an hour. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Well, before you go, Tom, there was a couple of pictures we wanted to show you. We have watch parties taking place all over the country. And uh, let's see if we can put one of these watch parties up for you to see this is from Ohio this is a person who has a watch party it looks like in a classroom that is so awesome isn't that great that folks are watching with us yeah I know people all across the globe are watching this and we really want to put on a good show for them today all right well I'll let you back in the all right, room I, gotta get I back know in there. <laughs> you're excited all right take care thanks for joining us thank you Okay, let's introduce you to the people who built InSight, Lockheed Martin Space outside of Denver. These are the folks who built Viking in 1976 and Mars Phoenix in 2008. The operations team is there and Lockheed InSight EDL manager Tim Lin is standing by. Tim, what's going on in there? Um, team's getting really excited. We're uh, just about ready. We're, what, about a half an hour from uh, entry and uh, the start of entry, descent, and landing. So the team is really excited, focused, but also very excited about uh, the upcoming successful entry, descent, and landing we're, we're getting close to. Well, we talked about the fact that Insight is based on tried and true technology. It's based on Phoenix, but you've had to make a couple of changes for Insight. What were they? Yeah, we've, uh, so obviously, as you said, we leveraged Phoenix a lot. There was a lot of great things that we're able to take from the Phoenix mission, but InSight is a, is a unique mission. It's landing towards the equator of Mars, um, and a number of things are different. Um, the, uh, where we're landing, we're about one and a half kilometers higher in altitude. Um, in addition, uh, and so what that's required us to do is actually come in a little bit more shallow. Um, in addition, we're a little bit heavier than, uh, than Phoenix was, so we've had to increase some of the strength of some of the lander itself. So the parachute, we have had to increase the strength. Um, we actually deploy the parachute a little bit higher because of some of the differences in our entry timeline. Um, and because of when we're landing, we're landing um, towards the end of dust season, so we also have actually increased the thickness of the heat shield. So we're about a quarter inch thicker on our heat shield to accommodate that, that potential sandblasting that we could see when we actually do our entry descent landing. All so right. a number of things we've changed, but we've obviously leveled, leveraged a lot from uh, the very successful Phoenix uh, mission as well. That's fantastic. So you were able to kind of customize it because there were some concerns earlier on that there was a dust storm taking place. It was dust storm season. That's right. In fact, we've had a lot of great support from our orbiting assets, uh, MRO and Odyssey, a couple of spacecraft that we've uh, partnered with JPL and that were built here at Lockheed Martin. They've actually provided a lot of great insight into, uh, into the weather on Mars, any dust storms that are potentially happening on Mars. And as of today and actually the last couple of weeks, it's been great on the surface of Mars. We're anticipating a very nominal, very seasonal um, weather in terms of both density, atmosphere, as well as temperature and dust storms appear to be um, very benign. So we're very optimistic it's going to be a great day for landing on the surface of Mars. All right. That's great news. Thanks, Tim. And I know your team is getting excited over there just as much as we are. Take Absolutely. care. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay.
The time now is 11.21. It's about 20 minutes. The tension is building in both control rooms. It's about 20 minutes before cruise stage separation. It's not too far off. Cruise stage separation is expected at about 40 minutes past the hour. So we are indeed getting close. So where is Insight going to Mars? It's a place called Elysium Panicia. Panicia is Latin for flat. Elysium is ancient Greek for afterlife paradise. It's located near the equator, north of Gale Crater, not too far from Curiosity Rover. The team calls it the biggest parking lot on Mars. It's a place that's safe, got plenty of sunshine that will power solar instruments to study the interior of Mars. What's inside Mars? We know a lot about what's inside Earth. But at Mars, we've only just scratched the surface. To learn how Mars formed, we have to study its deep interior. NASA's InSight lander was designed to do just that by taking the planet's vital signs. Listening investigator of Mars InSight. InSight is a mission to Mars, but we keep hearing again and again it's more than a mission to Mars. That's right, Gay. I mean, we're going to Mars, obviously, to study the Martian interior and to, to, to map out the divisions inside Mars, but we want to use that information to understand more about the solar system as a whole and how rocky planets form. And rocky planets, we have an image to show folks. So we're talking about Earth. The moon, Mar Mars. Mercury, Venus, yes, uh, the, the, the planets of the inner solar system that are made mostly of rocks. And they all show, share the same basic structure with a, a dense iron core, uh, a rocky mantle, and then a, a crust of lighter uh, silicate rocks. But the very details of the uh, thicknesses of those layers, the sizes, and the, the, the the uh, compositions um, give us a lot of clues as to how those planets form and why they went down very different paths and into the, the different planets we see today. So explain to me, we are going to have a lander, you're going to be on the surface, how will you be able to study the interior? Ah, well, we use what are called geophysical instruments. They use uh, uh, the principles of physics to actually see through the rocks. I mean, we're using seismic waves, uh, the same way you might use a, a flash bulb uh, to, to, to take pictures of something. We're using uh, Mars quakes, which send out vibrational waves through the planet. And as they go through the planet, they uh, reflect off boundaries. They get uh, bent. They change their velocity. And it changes the um, wiggles that you see on a seismogram. When we uh, go through the planet, you can see that here it, it hits the various boundaries and those waves are reflected, sometimes they're bent. It becomes a pretty complicated uh, pattern, but scientifically we've learned uh, over the, the last 100 years how to interpret the, the, the code of the signal as it comes back up to the surface and the, seismogram, the seismometers uh, pick up that signal and then turn it into data that we can use on Earth to understand you know, what the 3D structure is of the planet. So normally you use three seismometers. In this case, you're bringing SICE, that's one. How are you going to be able to get that information using one? Well, we had to get kind of clever um, because uh, on the Earth, you know, usually you have plenty of seismometers. You can use uh, multiple seismometers to, to triangulate in on, on where the, the earthquake is. On Mars, we're going to do uh, something a little bit different. We're going to use not only the, the P and the S waves that you may have heard about, but we're using the surface waves. And here you can see uh, the surface waves kind of moving out from uh, Mars quake. And as it passes over the InSight lander, you can see the seismogram up there in the upper left-hand corner uh, where, you, where you have the, the wiggles. Now, those waves keep on going around the planet. And because Mars is not so, so large, um, still have a, they still have a fair amount of amplitude. They're, they haven't gotten completely uh, uh, damped out by the time it's gone all the way around the planet 
passes over this, the, the spacecraft again, and finally, even the wave that went the other way around the planet uh, comes across and hits us yet a third time. And so we have extra information uh, over just the P and the S wave. We have these surface wave arrivals that we can use to, to uh, pinpoint the distance from the Mars quake to our lander. And then we use uh, something called polarization analysis to figure out which direction the waves are coming from. And by doing that, we can do the same thing that uh, we can do with uh, three stations on the Earth, just using the P and the S waves. And very quickly, there is still another instrument built by DLR that's also being carried up by InSight. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's our heat flow probe. And it's a, it's a pretty cool instrument that uses a, a mechanical mole, we call it, to, to uh, burrow its way down into the surface. It has a, a motor with a, a, that, that winds up a hammer and it knocks itself down just a few millimeters at a time. Uh, but we do that uh, 20 or 30,000 hammer strokes and it gets us down we hope to get down to be about 16 feet below the surface. And once we get down there, we're actually measuring the heat coming out of the planet by measuring the temperature along the cable uh, as it comes up to the surface and looking at how that, that, uh, heat, that temperature increases as we go down and extrapolate that deep into the planet to understand how much energy there is inside the planet to, de to, to drive the geology and to drive volcanism, Mars quakes, all kinds of activity. It's amazing how much you'll be able to learn from the surface about the interior. That's right. I think it's, uh, it, it is amazing. And it's, uh, it's been something that I've been working on for my whole professional career. And it's just, I, I find it fascinating. But All right. We'll talk about that. Thanks, okay. Bruce. Bruce first thought of a mission like this, as he mentions, 40 years ago when he was a graduate student. The rest of the team hasn't waited quite that long, but this is a big moment for them too. Recently, we sat down with a few of the members and asked them what is it going to be like as we get close to landing. It's a very difficult thing to do and everything has to go perfectly. As humans, we've sent 17 different missions to the surface of Mars and 10 of them have crashed. Before we can land on Mars, we have to get to Mars. How do we get to Mars? The main responsibility of the navigation team is to ensure that the spacecraft is delivered to the right point at the top of the Martian atmosphere. The target location is about 12 kilometers in size. Our accuracy is comparable to shooting a basketball from Staples Center in downtown LA and hitting nothing but net in a basketball hoop in New York City that is moving at a speed of about two feet per second and is spinning about its axis. The landing site, you know, we have an ellipse that's pretty big. It's about 60 miles long. We could land anywhere in that ellipse. There's a chance that we could land right on a rock and we don't really have any control over that. So that's what makes me nervous. We've tested the radar by flying it on a helicopter. We've tested pieces of the heat shield by putting them in an arc jet facility. We've tested the parachute by testing it in a wind tunnel. And putting all that together in a very tightly controlled sequence where every single thing has to go right, we've never tested that. And the first time it's gonna happen is, is once you deliver us to Mars. Live coverage of the InSight landing from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. We are about a half hour away from landing and people all over the world are watching. Um, take a look at a map that we have for you. We can show you right now. This is a watch in person map where people have watch parties all over the world, all over the United States, in Paris, in Berlin, even off the coast of Madagascar. And folks in the Big Apple will all
all stations. This is uh, DDL phase lead on inside cord. Uh, I wanted to point out that you may have noticed that our verification calls based on XPAN data are lagging several minutes behind the procedure, and this is, this is expected. This is a delay that we were expecting. When we switch to UHF, we expect the delay to disappear, but just as a heads up. All stations this systems, we can confirm we are in tree minus 20 minutes. EDL NAV 2 has been initiated. The star tracker has been powered off. Com, Marco Khan, Marco Bravo has cleared the EDL send pipe link. Okay. Uh, Marco, clarify. Slew to inertial or started bent pipe? Slew to appropriate attitude for bent pipe. Bent pipe mode will be entered shortly. Okay. Thank you very much. Propagate from here on out, and we'll use velocity and acceleration. So we have powered off our star tracker, and we're on our NAV2 software, and everything's looking great. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Julie. Thanks. All right. The crew stage separation is just about four minutes away, and Rob Manning joins us now. Rob is the chief engineer here at JPL and an absolute veteran of Mars landings. We're going to play a little video for you right now. You haven't seen it yet, but we'll roll it. Go ahead. This no is Lander is still alive. 14 reports, carrier lock, kids. That day, Rob. There you are. You were the phase lead. You were sitting up front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why it looked like it when it's successful. Yes. <laughs> I hate to see what it would be like if I wasn't successful. <laughs> But talk about that. What is EDL like? 
Why is it so hard? Well, it, it's many years of work by many, many people who struggle to put all the pieces together, and particularly because we can't really test anti-descent and landing on this planet. It's much more complicated. Um, Mars has a lower atmosphere, thick, thinner atmosphere, less Speaking gravity. Um, Marco you Tom. just can't put the pieces. So as imagine you had a big Broadway production, Marco B but you couldn't really do Marco the Alpha show please, until please, all the audience shows up. So that's what it feels like. So, it's, so you never really know if you've really done it right. Well, we've done it seven times. Can we say that, hey, piece of cake, we know what we're doing? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, it, 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 we get better at it, and there's no doubt. We've learned. We've learned for both the successes and our own failures, including uh, failures of other missions outside of this country. So those pieces come together in our mind's eye. We try to put the, what we learn together and and just do the best we can. And, and if we don't succeed, we will learn because we are collecting data on the way down. If, we, if something bad happens today, we'll be able to take what we learned. Even though we may fall on the ground after getting kicked off the horse, we'll get back up, brush ourselves off, figure out what we did wrong, and get back on the horse. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty. Just very quickly, give us some possible scenarios of what could happen during EDL uh, today, especially during communications. Uh, well, the, the, the great news about having communications, I, there's almost, uh, almost anything that go wrong, we, there's a very good chance we'll figure it out. But things like, you know, the parachute has to go right. We know you don't open parachutes on Earth going Mach one and a half. Uh, one and a half times the speed of sound. You just don't do that. You don't need to on this planet, but we have to because if we waited any longer, we'd be on the ground. The very complicated radar system has to work from outer space all the way to the ground and look for this, look for the ground. What if it locked up on the heat shield? Well, we've tried to avoid that problem. We fixed that problem. We think uh, to uh, to prevent that from happening. But what if we got it wrong? Things like that could could happen, and our vehicle could have things bad happen, yes, but, right. but we worked hard to prevent them. So at this time we expect we're getting that close. The we're going to go to the control room for cruise stage separation, Rob. Okay. Thank you, MRO. Inside systems, EDL comma. Go ahead. On inside court. At this time, MRO has, will have loaded their electro sequences. Uh, Marco is expecting carrier lock uh, at any time. Marco B is reported there in bent pipe. Um, still waiting on A. Copy that. Thank you. Radio Science Report, UHF carrier detected. EDL Con, Marco Bravo, Marco Alpha is in bed pipe mode. Marco Bravo has locked on the carrier. Marco Alpha has also locked on carrier. <laughs> System based on inside cord. As expected, the DSN has LOS for inside expand. Copy that, thank you. All station, InSight systems on InSight court. DSN has lost the expand signal from InSight, indicated expected cruise stage separation. Standing by for UHF signal acquisition via Marco or Radio Science.
We are about five minutes from entry and have confirmation we've lost the X-band signal from InSight. This was expected because we have transitioned from the antenna on the cruise stage to the UHF antenna on board the spacecraft. Ground stations have detected the UHF signal and Marco has locked on the signal. This confirms that InSight is transmitting UHF signals as expected. InSight telemetry through the Marco relay is not expected until about two minutes before entry. So Rob, that was exactly what we were hoping to hear, that yes. the Marcos are The vehicle working. has also performed the turn to entry maneuver. The vehicle is turning away from a sun pointing attitude and oriented itself to enter the Martian atmosphere. Uh, this is a big first step. Uh, getting, just getting the, the cruise stage separated, uh, it's now, as, after the vehicle turns itself to the right orientation, the cruise stage is now going to be, uh, f get further and further away until it's about three or four football fields away and will burn up in parallel as the vehicle enters Mars. And, and Christine mentioned turn to entry. What does that mean? Well, it's because the cruise stage has to be pushed off to one side uh -huh. like this. The rest of the vehicle has to turn to face the atmosphere and to be dead nuts on as it hits hits the uh, the top of the atmosphere. So this is taking all the heat coming into the atmosphere. Exactly. It'll be both provide a source of drag, but also thermal protection because it gets over 1,500 degrees Celsius on the top of the, on this heat shield. Very very hot. Uh, but on the inside of the heat shield, it may be only a, f uh, a fraction of a few degrees above room temperature. So it's a wonderful protective device to keep our lander safe. All right. So the next thing we're standing by for is is entry, entry. hitting through the going to the top of the atmosphere, gradually slowing down. Right now, the vehicle's just now beginning to. We'll be, very soon, we'll be f beginning to feel the atmosphere touching it. Actually, entry is above the atmosphere slightly, so it's really not until a few, uh, half a minute or so before after entry before we start really detecting the fact that that atmosphere is slowing us down. All right, we'll be standing by. Yes, exciting. Entry is scheduled for 11.47. The crew stage SEP and the entry times are locked in, correct? They are. They're locked in when we selected the target and aimed the vehicle very precisely. That allows us to know exactly when we hit the entry point, which is uh, 35, 55 kilometers from the center of Mars. So we know those times are locked in, but what about all the other events that take place in EDM? Reggie Science reports dropping carrier power as expected. Marco A and Marco B have telemetry. Just heard, both Marcos have telemetry. They are doing their job. These small CubeSats are relaying ones and zeros uh, with a few seconds lag. From from the vehicle up to the up to these two vehicles, and they re forward them back to Earth to the deep space network using X-band antennas. And, and keep in mind, this was all an experiment. We weren't sure that this was going to work, but we had this need that we didn't have live communication right. in this particular mission. Well, we don't really need communications. We don't need their information, except if something went wrong. We would very much like to get the data right now. We have other spacecraft. We are spacecraft. now receiving insight telemetry via the Marco relay. Ah, it's, it's flowing into the space. That means the team now can watch the data flowing onto their screens as if they're commuting directly. This data to the will provide detailed information about the state of the spacecraft throughout EDL. We 
were on pins and needles waiting for that because we weren't really sure. Uh, this is wonderful news. Uh, this, this will allow us to give some, uh, if this continues working uh, all the way to the ground and beyond, uh, we might even see a, a first picture from the surface of Mars. Wouldn't that be great? Very soon. Atmospheric entry on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Here we go. So in a few seconds, the vehicle will start sensing the atmosphere. I said 35, 22 kilometers from the center of Mars. And it's going to start to slow down very, very slowly at first, but then faster and faster and faster till uh, to, to reaches about 7 Gs. I made that mistake on the video. It's actually 7 <laughs> Gs, not 12. Uh, and so, it, it will, it, but we'll still very, very quickly slow down. And, uh, and, and from 15... In approximately one minute, inside is expected to reach its maximum heating rate. Oh, yes. Plasma blackout is possible during peak heating and could cause a temporary dropout of telemetry. This could last for as long as two minutes. Yeah, the, the gas that comes off the heat shield as it's slowing down, it looks like a meteor if you're on Mars watching the streak go by. That brightness of gas does interfere with the radio reception. And so it's possible that uh, Marco will lose that signal while it's going through this very hot entry. But not to be alarmed. Not to be alarmed. It's, it's part of the design. We, we, we completely expect it. Radio science reports plasma blackout as expected. Okay. Oh, wow. Ground stations have reported plasma blackout. Still receiving InSight telemetry via Marco. Marco Alpha has carrier interruption. InSight should now be experiencing the peak heating rate. Portions of the heat shield may reach nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it protects the lander from the heating environment. That's hot. I'll Marco Province shows carrier interruption, but still in lock. Inside has passed through peak deceleration. Telemetry shows the spacecraft saw about eight Gs. Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo maintain R lock. Radio science reports carrier detected. Yeah. So several different communications coming in. Inside is now traveling at a velocity of 2,000 meters per second. It seems to have passed this very critical point of peak heating and peak deceleration. The next big step is parachute inflation. And you can see that on our timeline on the bottom of the screen. The next event is parachute deploy. InSight is now traveling at 1,000 meters per second. Oh, very close. Once InSight slows to about 400 meters per second, it will deploy its 12 meter diameter supersonic parachute. The parachute will deploy nominally at about Mach 1.7. Standing by for parachute deploy. Radio science reports a sudden change in Doppler. Ground stations are observing signals consistent with parachute deploy. Marco Alpha, Marco Bravo, maintain lock status. Telemetry shows parachute deployment. Radar powered on. Heat shield separation commanded. This is really good news so far. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm on pins and needles.
We have radar activation where the radar is beginning to search for the ground. Once the radar locks on the ground and inside is about one kilometer above the surface, the lander will separate from the back shell and begin terminal descent using its 12 descent engines. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. <laughs> Standing by for lander separation. Carrier interruption on Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo. Lander separation commanded. Yes. Altitude 600 meters. Gravity turn, altitude 400 meters. We're getting there. 300 meters. 200 meters, 80 meters, 60 meters, 50 meters, constant velocity, 37 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, 17 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Square. Boy, people are weathering the rain to see this. <laughs> they can't help. more to do though. Uh, it's there's a lot more to, ask to go on both today and the, and the days that follow before the science can begin. But you know just getting a vehicle on from Earth to the surface of Mars is no mean feat. And, and Rob could you talk about that? I mean just the mere accomplishment here that we're seeing. It, it's you have to understand that this 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 vehicle is very it's very complicated. Um, it uses 12 engines. Each of those engines are pulsed 10 times a second, producing these little tiny uh, impulses, almost like little bullets that keep the vehicle uh, going at a constant velocity as it, as it approaches the ground. and still going o over five miles an hour, so those legs feel a fair amount of crush. We still don't know the state of the vehicle right now. We need to look to make sure there are no rocks nearby. The solar panels have to, are, will be in just a, in just a few, uh, in about five to 10 minutes, 
will begin to open up. They're waiting for the dust to settle because the dust were, was certainly a lot of dust being lifted in the air around the vehicle right now, which is now just settling. So we're standing by after touchdown. It waits um, a, a couple of minutes to give us an X band beep. And so we are standing by for that. It's a communication that comes directly to Earth from InSight. Yes. Um, and, and it goes uh, uh, to the Deep Space Network. There's also something that might be happening now, if we're very lucky, uh, InSight might be able to relay uh, a, an image or a parcel I image taken just a few, a couple minutes after landing. So I'm, I'm standing by hoping to see that. But if that doesn't happen, we'll certainly get more images later uh, in our Odyssey Pass in well, about five hours. We see Bruce Banner waiting for it there they are. They're, they're, they're I, I don't for, know if they see it yet they're waiting that's that's Justin Mackey and Bruce Banner uh, looking carefully at the cameras to see what they might see uh, they're now, waiting for the image to come back so this is the first image from inside itself inside is taking a picture with one yes. of its two cameras yes. it's probably a uh, view of what's directly in front yes. of the spacecraft right yes. in front of the lander. This is a camera that it would be using to figure out, is this a good space? Exactly. Is it a good place to put down our instruments? So it is going to take an image and then send that image to the Marcos. The Marcos in turn will relay it back down to Earth. That's correct. They got it. And oh, no. Let's, let's, let's just wait. Let's see what they saw. There it is. Earth wow, what? Right. So it's great. I don't see a lot of. Uh, I don't see a lot of. Uh... Let's explain that image. Now this image has a dust cover on top EDL of it. Tom, we have so lost the signal for Marco. You can see potentially a lot of. Uh, uh, radio science uh, reports that might be uh, on the camera. LOS for UHF. So we don't know what I'm looking Thank at. Thank you, like, everybody on EDL.com. All right. Yeah. Yay, Marco. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, there it is. You can see a better view. You can see that really is debris. And there is the horizon back there, uh, the bluish sky. Uh, um, that's part of the lander deck on the front left. Um, I can't take out, but it looks like there's not a lot of rocks in the field of view. Insights, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, CubeSat's relay communications job is done. They're now flying on. They're now taking pictures back of, toward Mars. Uh, uh, hopefully, MRO, which flew overhead, might have been lucky enough to capture the descent of this InSight lander on its, under its parachute. Uh, while, was, while, while this was going on, it, MRO was flying overhead, recording the data, uh, um, like a, also monitoring the tra transactions and recording every bit of signal it could. And, but it also had the ability to take a picture. And maybe we'll, like we did with, with uh, both Phoenix and later for Pure. System based on inside cord, the DSN and X band. Uh, Radio X -band. science reports X band carrier detected. The DSN and X band radio science have acquired the X band touchdown signal for insight.
Next band signal will continue for four and a half minutes with insight in nominal mode. Copy that. Thank you. Radio science reports nominal carrier 30 seconds past the first acquisition. So we're all nominal on the surface. DLCOM, MRO Electra on Inside Ops, Opto Loop recording completed at 20.04.34. System based on inside cord. Go ahead. 
Yeah, the DSN has just had LOS on the inside X-band touchdown signal. And that time was uh, 20507. All stations with systems, we have a confirmation of LOS per procedure at step 2.11-005. We will perform a post-EDL assessment poll on net. This is your 20-minute warning. Okay, Radio Science reports X band LOS at 200601. And we will continue to monitor until Earth set. Radio Science at Site 8, I copy.
EDL Con, Marco Alpha has started retransmission. Thank you, Ed thank you, Marco.